If you've been on Twitter at all in the past couple weeks, you've almost certainly seen this. This is Cursor. It's the new AI code editor thing. I've seen tons and tons of people, even people I really respect like WebDev Cody, singing its praises, talking about how good this is for writing code. And for the longest time, I've been pretty skeptical on LLMs. I used Copilot when it came out, and I actually found myself turning it off because I really didn't like having that auto completion in my editor. But recently, I have been really heavily using Claude to the point where I'm even actually paying for it. It's that good. The Claude 3.5 stuff gets hyped a lot, uh, but it's actually kind of there. I recently kind of had my aha moment with this when I was going through and doing some refactoring in Block. And initially with Block, we were using Clerk for our authentication because we need to do stuff beyond just signing in with username and password. We need to log in with Google and then we need to get access to the user's Google calendar to sync that in and make the value prop of the app work. But that was kind of a pain in the ass to do custom, but I went into Claude and just kind of asked it to generate the code for that for me and go through and do these things. And within like an hour, I had the entire thing implemented. I literally didn't need to use this $20 a month SaaS that would end up massively racking up my bill over time. I just went into Claude, got it all generated out, and it was really, really impressive. So I've been using that a lot lately. And the sort of idea behind Cursor is it puts that directly in your code editor. And this is Cursor. And you might notice that this looks exactly like VS Code because it is. Um, not even just like, oh, they made it look like VS Code to be kind of similar and fit the same vibes so that people would be comfortable with it. No, this is quite literally VS Code. When I opened it for the first time, I thought I had accidentally opened up VS Code because it loaded all my settings, it loaded all of my extensions, it loaded all my keybinds, like even my weird stuff. Like I have it bound so that if you do leader, which it, for me is space, if you do leader S, it pulls up my search. I use this all the time. It has all of my different keybinds for opening up different tabs. It, it eats my VS Code environment, but working in cursor. There's been a bit of controversy around this because VS Code is open source and effectively what happened here is a company took the MIT licensed VS Code, yoinked all of that, closed sourced it, and put some AI features on top of it and is now charging $20 a month. This article by Steve Sewell on Builder.io does a really good job of kind of going through this whole situation and the kind of ethical debacle that they're going through right now of what do we do about things like this happening. I'm not the guy to really get deep into this. I'm sure that this article and stuff like this will be showing up on Prime and Theo's channel within a couple weeks. So stay tuned for that if you want to get a deeper look at that. But this is, you know, this is VS Code. And if you take the kind of ethical implications of them just yoinking a giant open source project out, it actually makes it really nice because the adoption on this is beyond trivial. I didn't have to go through and set up a bunch of painful stuff like you do with NeoVim. I'll talk about that later. There's work going on to make this work in NeoVim as well, but for right now, I'm very VS Copium'd up, so I'm just going to kind of stay there. And I kind of want to show you guys how this actually works because I've been playing around right now. One of the big projects I'm working on is rebuilding the backend infrastructure for Block. Um, if you want to see me actually use Cursor, just skip ahead. We'll put up a timestamp right here. But I do want to kind of go on a brief little tangent here because I think this is worth talking about. We are restructuring the backend for Block. Initially, we were doing it. I've made videos about this before where we were using a React Native app with a Next.js backend hooked together with TRPC. And that's really cool and it's really nice when it works, but it's, I found it to be incredibly brittle and I, you know, we've brought on other people to help out with the team. It's a bunch, it's a bunch of college guys and just young guys figuring stuff out and playing with it. It's not venture backed or anything crazy like that. More of kind of a side project right now, which I think has some real potential. But, you know, when we were going through and building this out, I had to step away from it for a month when we were launching the new Insider Viz. And when I came back, it was a living nightmare to get back into. Any little thing can just kind of break in that and you end up with this really kind of brittle tower of abstractions that just makes it hard to work with. And especially as we're getting into more complicated pieces of the app, like we have to do calendar syncing and stuff like that. And that means that there are background jobs that have to happen in your application in order for that to work. So ultimately, that meant that I wanted to kind of refactor how the back end worked. I love the idea of having my front end and back end and all that stuff in one big mono repo and having it all work. The reality of that is, is it ends up being kind of more painful than it's worth. At the end of the day, you kind of just, you know, having a separate back end that's just an HTTP API and then calling that from your React Native app really isn't too bad. There is a lot of boilerplate that admittedly goes into that, especially when you're dealing with type definitions and stuff like that. 
But that's kind of one of those things where these LLMs that we're talking about here make that a lot less painful. Uh, when I get to the example in a minute here, I'll show you the code I'm writing here for the back end, we're using the open API swagger documentation. So you can see right here, this is just, it's in progress, but this is like the documentation auto generated for our API. And by writing it in this uh, setup where we have our follow schema, our follow response schema, we go through and define all these different parts of it. When I go over here to look at my follow post request, I get all this information right here. And even more importantly, we can use uh, third party packages to generate type definitions for our front end with this. And again, this is a lot of boilerplate. It's a pain in the ass to write this. At my uh, old job, uh, one of the APIs I built was a Fastify API with the Swagger documentation. It was a very similar setup. We had a JavaScript backend with actually there, we were using full normal iOS raw. So I think they were writing Swift. And I had this open API documentation because it made their the front end team's lives a lot easier. It was very much worth having. But for me as the developer, it just resulted in me having to write a lot of this crap when really we, all I need to do, like this follow route is literally like three lines. It's literally just inserting a follow into the follow table. You have to write all this crap to get it to work. But with an LLM, now all we have to do is just tell it like, hey, generate me the boilerplate for this follow route and then it'll do it. And that's what we're gonna do here in a second. But all of this, what I was really trying to lead into talking about is the way we're architecting our application is now we're leaning into, I'm trying out SST here. It is basically an infrastructure as code platform for AWS. And there were kind of two ways we could do this. We could either go the traditional route of having a giant monolithic backend where we just run all of our queues on there. We run all of our data processing on there. We just get like basically a server and run it that way. If you go on Twitter, you will see tons of people who are a huge proponent of that. But generally speaking, there's a lot of backlash against like serverless and using cloud platforms and not just kind of using raw monoliths. Uh, personally, I prefer kind of getting deeper into these infra platforms. I started out kind of doing the route of stitching together a ton of different SaaSes. And as we've gotten better and better, my team and I, we've really found ourselves gravitating more and more towards just using AWS because they have everything you need and just getting baked super deeply in there. And that's what SST allows us to do. It's basically what we're doing here is we're creating a um, API of lambdas here with our Hono API. So that's just a uh, Lambda API. And then we're creating some background queues here. Th this is just a demo queue because I'm in the middle of developing this, but this will eventually turn into a queue where we can send an event that's like, hey, we need to process this user's calendar and do syncing back and forth from Google servers and all that stuff. And basically just uh, architect everything deeply into AWS. It's not gonna be mobile, it's not portable, but I think there's a lot of power we're gonna get out of this. And so far it's been a cool experience. But I'll definitely have videos talking about whether or not this was a good idea in the future. God only knows. But anyways, with all that nonsense out of the way, the thing that we're actually here to talk about is how to use these LLMs to kind of make your code generation faster. So uh, like I kind of talked about earlier, the code in here is very heavy in boil boilerplate. Right now I am migrating my old API from a TRPC router to a Hono router. And I was actually able to go through and just tell Claude like, hey, can you just convert these TRBC routes into Hono routes? And it did a pretty good job. Unfortunately, there are just so many in this case that I kind of need to manually do it because the context windows aren't big enough. Um, so let me just show you how this actually works. We're gonna go ahead and port this is following route over from my block turbo, which is the old mono repo to the new separate backend. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go over here and then I'm gonna say command K to generate. I'm gonna say generate, uh, a new endpoint in the same style as those above. That is a, is a get a request that checks if a user is following another user ID. Let's see what it comes up with here. So it'll go ahead, it'll give me the schema for my input. So target user ID, uh, check follow response. So the query will have this, that's what I want in here. Uh, so it'll just give an is following it's a Boolean, that's correct. And then it'll give me right here into this guy. So I'm just gonna accept this. We're gonna take a look at how correct this is. Um, target user ID, yep. Uh, select from follow where the follower is the profile. And this is the middleware in Hono. This isn't a Hono video, but it's really cool. Some of the stuff you can do in here, very TRPC like. Um, and then we get the followed, uh, we're following the target user ID, limit one is following, yep, that's it. It, it just did it. I wrote a sentence and this endpoint is done. 
And that's really cool. I uh, Beforehand, I was going through and doing all of this in VS Code, and the way I was doing it is I was going to claw.edu and then just typing out my prompt and copy pasting over, um, which works pretty well. There's no real issues in doing it that way, but this is admittedly faster. And one of the cooler things I think you can do in here is um, this L. I've Again, I haven't even been using it all that much. Uh, this is very recent that I've gotten into this. But one of the cool things you can do with this is I can go in here and I'm just going to highlight this right here. And I'm going to do Command L to chat with it. And then I'm going to say, um, explain this endpoint. Uh, so I'll just tell it to explain this endpoint. And it can go through in here and it can go and just give me a step-by-step -step breakdown of what it's doing. Because really at the end of the day, all what cursor is, is it's just wrapping the functionality of the LLM into VS Code with some nice extensions because this is just kind of generating a prompt for you where it provides this as context and then puts that in there. It's a really basic form of RAG and it really is just kind of a UI, but it's a really good UI and I can definitely see myself using this more. There's another project out there called Avante.NeoVim. So you can see here, it's a very similar experience to Cursor. Basically what they're doing is they have this little chat over here where you can highlight your code, get more information on it. And this is kind of a less abstracted version of it because you can see down here the way this actually works is um, you're literally just setting your API keys and it's just making API calls to the um, LLMs. So you could build something like this for yourself. I um, you know, NeoVim is one of those technologies that I've wanted to get into for a very long time. It's just that every time I do, I find myself just like, you know, it would be nicer if I was in VS Code and especially as we've been getting deeper into like uh, doing Python work for InsiderViz and that kind of thing. It's just nice having like Jupyter Notebooks built into it, having all the extensions there. Um, I get all the arguments for NeoVim. It's really cool and I love the aesthetic of it. I love the idea of it. It's just that in practicality, I really don't think it's worth my time and I don't see myself doing that. But if you guys are looking for a cursor-like experience without having to go through and download more VC backed software because I guess that's a bad thing these days. Um, go try out Avante.neovim. It's pretty cool. So yeah, I know that was a very long, weird, kind of crazy video where I just kind of went through a bunch of different things. But uh, if you guys enjoyed that, make sure you like and subscribe and uh, I will talk to you soon.